You are listening to Mark Lack, and this is Retail 101 Online. Welcome, everyone, to the first Retail 101 Online episode in the series. To those that do not know me yet, my name is Mark Lack, and I have been in retail now for just about four decades. Sounds crazy when I say this out loud, though. Like most people, retail wasn't a career choice for me. I sort of fell into it, found out that I was okay at it, enjoyed it, and I'm still here now with my grey hair and creaky knees. The thought of doing a podcast 40 years ago was non-existent, but that's not the only thing that has changed in those 40 years. The retail landscape has changed quite dramatically, but at the same time, at its core, it has remained the same. The simple way of looking at it is that we put products on a clean shelf with a price ticket and of course hopefully sell them for a profit. You will soon recognize a pattern in how I speak about retail. I'm always trying to break it down into its basic components and talking in threes. Products, clean shelf, price ticket being my starter for three. Who should listen to this series of podcasts? Well, when we get to the marketing episode, we can discuss all about customer marketing. For now, the fact that you have tuned in is great it means you want to learn more. Maybe you are looking at career choices and want to know more about retail. Perhaps you are just new to retail and want a crash course because you are not getting it at work right now. Possibly you are already in retail and want to fast track your learning to move to the next level. You may even be a manager who is looking to fill gaps in their retail education or refresh their understanding of certain topics. Or you are a senior manager looking for tips, hints or hacks to improve the stores under your control, enliven and empower your employees, and improve the customer experience. For now though, let's get into what Retail 101 Online is all about and who I am. Wherever I have been around the world, including the supposed more advanced countries, I have noticed a lack of basic understanding of what retail is about. Many people join retail organisations and the fundamentals are not taught anymore. These are expected to be learnt OTJ, on the job, or maybe to be absorbed by osmosis. The systems, policies and procedures that have been honed to within an inch of their life also means that there is now a lack of freedom to express and showcase a store to its customers. Everyone follows checklists, and don't get me wrong, checklists are handy, and I shall discuss this in future episodes, and there will also be a document section on the website retail101online.com, exactly about checklists. I quite often say that over the last 40 years, we have turned retail grocery shopping into a really boring, monotonous experience. Four beige walls filled with beige shelving, or black now as it becomes de rigueur to be a bit more premium, read inflate pricing by 5% of course, and we have the same beige products as everyone else. We have then been closing down the exciting departments of the bakeries, the butcheries and delicatessen counters to optimise the workforce and save customers money in the process, allegedly. We are removing ourselves from the customer even more by not having these service counters, and now even checkouts are going all self-serve and self-scan. If I'm beginning to sound all ranty and grumpy old man on you, then I have to own that because I have played a part in the dumbing down of the customer experience over the last 40 or so years. But this is a point of starting this venture up. How do we get back to the retail basics and what are they? There is an opportunity, currently unfulfilled, to really fulfill customers' needs again. Shopping for food has become a chore, yet shopping for food, or any products really, should be an exciting assault on the senses. We have lost that, but we still have time to recover. Over this series of episodes, we shall be delving into the inner workings of retail. The aim for this is to be a centre of learning, learning those things you are too afraid to ask, as it might seem dumb at the time, or were unable to absorb the information, like Mork from the Mork and Mindy TV show about an alien that lands on Earth and absorbs his liquids by drinking through his finger. So far, we have a list of 29 episode ideas to script and record. Everything from availability through to pricing tools and on to finance for non-financial managers. 
There are also so many acronyms within retail that I will dedicate a whole episode to demystifying them and explaining what each one means. As an acronym appears in a specific episode, we will also explain it straight away. We also want your inputs as well as to what you want explained and what you want to know more about. We aim to have a section on the website that will show the list of active episodes and future ones yet to be written. Over the years, I have also developed more than 35 training programs for retail. These range from just a few hours and some are as long as three days, including highly interactive and powerful strategy workshops. These will be hosted on the Retail 101 Online YouTube channel. And we will also put up some shorts on the latest craze channel, TikTok, using the same name. We have a lot to do, there is a lot to relearn, and our journey starts now. Our vision at Retail 101 Online is to be the go-to source for learning about all things retail. And the mission is to create an accessible cross-platform space where everyone can learn and understand how retail works, how to improve the customer experience, and generate sustainable profitability. I feel really lucky that my retail career has taken me around the world. Starting in Majestic Wines back in the mid 80s, sporting a fitting haircut for the time of course, where I was introduced to my first management role and where I picked up my first two mentors. Not that I understood what a mentor was back then, but over time I have recognized these two guys, who were both younger back then than I am now, were two of the people who along my retail journey have impacted my thoughts about retail and of course my own management style. David Curtis, who was the operations director back then, gave this young, impressionable, cocky, know nothing, but thought he knew everything, he gave me a chance to join a new store in a new part of the country. Then there was Nick Groves, the store manager for the Birmingham store. He gave me the freedom to express myself. I found merchandising to be a particular joy and was pretty good at it. Starting without a planogram and then managing to re-merchandise a whole country category and slotting the last product right to the end of the last pallet with not even a millimetre to spare at the end. It was quite uncanny. Majestic also introduced me to the concept of customer service, what it truly meant and still means today. The job of retail is to provide for the customer's needs. To do that, you also need to spend time finding out what they actually need. Majestic also employed a lot of fresh graduates, so the teams were young, highly educated, and keen to progress to management roles. Me? Oh, well, not so much. I was young, not so much educated. I never went to university, never got a degree. But that didn't seem to matter to David or Nick or my other colleagues, as we all just got on with the work. I progressed rapidly with Majestic, becoming an assistant manager in London, then to Leeds. But my real break came when I was asked back to Birmingham store. My old store, as the store manager. I had made it at 21. I was a store manager. Finally, as per my still cocky self back then. I also met my amazing wife at Majestic. I remember the first day I saw her. Nick, who was the area manager by now, asked me what I thought. And I remember saying that she will be trouble. Little did I know that just a few years later, we would be welcoming our daughter into the world and soon after that start actually traveling the world where my wife's business card would have on it as her job title, Head Troublemaker. For more than 30 years now, she has been my greatest fan and harshest critic, pushing me, consoling me when needed, but all the time knowing I could do more. Without her, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. I would probably still be merchandising the products and categories in Birmingham store, totally oblivious to the world and my own potential in it. It was actually my wife who suggested trying for a role in a new German company that was coming to these British shores. Most of us back then didn't know how to pronounce it properly and the products it stocked had funny names, but it was really cheap. My wife's love of Germany, having spent some time there in the early 70s, probably also played a part. So I applied and joined Aldi. What a change that was from Majestic. Hard discounting back then was not just in its infancy, it was barely a newborn. 
I was packed off to Germany to learn my trade and then straight back to the UK and plunked into the 20th store in Ashton. Aldi was another place I found more of my love for retail. I started to understand how to improve productivity. I learned about how shrinkage and wastage work. I tried to master ordering, stock management, and employee scheduling optimization. What a time to be alive, I thought. Of course, I wanted more, so then moved to save service stations in my first regional manager role. At 25, I was managing three area managers and 45 petrol stations. Running from the southwest in Exeter up to Stoke in the Midlands meant that in the first year I travelled nearly 100,000 miles in my new company car, a bright red Ford Sierra. I had made it again, and I was still only 25. And yes, still a cocky git, and the haircut had survived from the 80s too. Save did teach me a lot about how to manage remote teams and district managers. But, as ever, itchy feet and ambition meant it was soon time to move on again and to my second longest stint in a company and where my international career first took off. My experience within SAVE had introduced me to the world of wholesalers, as my franchise stores mostly bought their goods from them. I joined Booker Cash & Carry as an assistant manager first, and was then quickly promoted to store manager. My store was in Warwick, a huge, or so I thought back then, 2,000 square metre store in the heart of an historic tourist town. It had average sales, and was profitable due to its all year round Horeca trade, hotels, restaurants and catering. But I had plans. Using my customer service experience gleaned from my days at Majestic, I wanted to understand what our customers needed from us. I found and clicked on something that was very important back then, availability. This was the key that unlocked year-on-year -year sales growth of more than 40% for two years running. Availability will also be the subject of the second episode. Look out for that soon. Within Booker, I also came across the third person who impacted my thoughts about retail, Gordon Crow. He was the regional director, a huge title and presence back in those days. In fact, visits from the regional director were like a royal visit, but Gordon was both challenging and supportive during his visits. He had also run Booker's fledgling business in Portugal, so we were all a bit in awe of him. A brand new role was being advertised, country manager Thailand, and with my wife's full support, and a boot up the backside that I could do this, I applied. I was actually the only store manager to be interviewed. All of the others were district managers. So unfortunately, I didn't get the role. During my application process, Gordon had learnt of my ambition and summoned me to the regional head office in Coventry. My usual arrogance thought he was there to give me the job, but no. For two hours, he lambasted me about expat life how difficult it was to work in another country, trying to do business in another language, and generally tried to put me off. At the end, he asked what I thought. I still want to do it, was my reply. And then to my surprise, he fully supported my application and was probably the reason I ended up at the interview in the first place. Looking back now, I understand what Gordon was doing. He was testing my mettle, testing how serious I was. It certainly helped me, that's for sure. And I have used that technique a few times over the years with people I have interviewed to come onto my own team or are looking at a new role. So, what happened next? I'm not going to Thailand, am I? Well, no. Something even better happened. The new international team was being formed and I am offered the role of international operations support. That meant I would be traveling the world and supporting the new countries as we open bookers everywhere. Woohoo! I had made it, again, and was just under 30 years of age. During my time with Booker, I went to many far-flung places before finally settling down into Turkey as its country head. This was also the time that finally the 80s haircut was giving up the ghost. We had been in Malaysia and it was so hot and humid it was shaved down to a number one cut and has been there ever since. Going international taught me that retail around the world is essentially the same. We all have four walls, shelving with products on them and customers and employees. We may have a different language, but shareholders or owners, customers and employees all want similar things. 
I have now been to multiple countries and worked for multiple retailers on site. I've almost lost count of how many new stores I have opened, but for those of you who have followed me previously on LinkedIn, they could probably count them up. I have learned a lot more lessons along the way, picked up some additional mentors and mentored people too. So I'm not going to go into all of the details of the different roles and companies I have worked for, but wanted to give you some insight as to how I got to where I am today. I have worked at the coalface of retail. I didn't miraculously appear fresh out of a packet as a director or CXO. In Europe, I've worked in the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Germany, Bulgaria, Croatia, Turkey, and Switzerland. In the Middle East, I have worked in Oman, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Jordan, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And in the Far East, I have worked in Malaysia, Thailand, Pakistan, and Indonesia. The job titles have changed too, from Retail Director, Sales and Operations Director, Senior Operations Director, Chief Operating Officer, and Chief Executive Officer. But actually, the very basics of retail have not changed. I have worked in the different business cycle stages of STARS, S-T-A-R-S-S, -S -S, which is startup, turnaround, realignment, and success sustaining. But again, the very basics of retail have stayed the same. I've also worked across different channels and formats, from convenience stores, corporate retailing, department stores, hypermarkets, and e-commerce. And yet again, the basics of retail have stayed the same. Why am I saying this? Well, hopefully now it's plainly obvious. One of the reasons we decided to start up Retail 101 Online is to get back to some of the basics of retailing. Thank you for tuning in to the introductory episode of the series for Retail 101 Online so that you can understand who we are and what we are aiming to do. You are welcome to follow me on LinkedIn and X under both Mark Lack or Retail 101 Online or send me a message via the website. Make sure you subscribe as well as this really helps the channel to get out its message to as many people as possible and you can look out for the next episode. Remember, I am looking for your inputs, what you want to learn, and who knows, your question and your own voice may appear on the second series of episodes that I'm aiming to launch, which is called Retail Voices. This is where you get to hear from real people in retail. And yes, find yourself a mentor, someone who can show you the way, the way that I was shown. But until then, let me leave you again with the most basic thing in retail, in a set of three, of course, products on a clean shelf, with a price ticket. Start with this and you are already on your way to improving the customer's experience. And that's it folks. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you in the next episode, maybe in a couple of weeks time. Cheers.